June 13, 2000. This morning is a special one for Seoul. Thirteen hundred journalists from around the world congregate in front of a live broadcast from Pyongyang, coming in on the TV screen. The two Koreas have been in armed conflict for the past half century, the last nation still divided by the Cold War. These journalists are here to relay the news of the first summit between the two sides to the whole world. The door seems to be closing on a painful past, and the two nations moving into a new era of peace and reconciliation. a.m. South Korean President Kim Dae-jung leaves the presidential Blue House to embark on his journey to Pyongyang. It will be the first visit to the North by a South Korean president. The departure had been postponed one day by North Korea for technical reasons. <laughs> President Kim says that the meeting between the two Koreas, which have been divided for half a century, was meaningful in itself. One group of people speaking the same language and sharing the same culture. Yet it took 55 long years for leaders from these two nations to finally meet face to face due to years filled with distrust and conflict. The division of the peninsula was a result of the power struggle between the United States and the Soviet Union immediately following World War II. Subsequently, two nations were established the Communist North and the Democratic South. The misery of the two countries climaxed in the Korean War, which began in 1950. The combined casualty number was 1.26 million, and the resulting division separated more than 10 million family members. Although the war dragged on for three years, no victor was declared. Fighting ended with a ceasefire. From then until the present day, Korea has been considered one of the world's most dangerous regions of conflict. Due to the deep wounds of war and sharply conflicting ideologies, the tension in the peninsula has never been resolved. The Cold War still divides the two countries. This is truly an historic occasion. For more than half a century, North and South Korea have been in minimal communication with recurrent tensions and hostilities. This offers a chance for a new relationship, a beginning. Uh, of the building of trust. The president's plane departing from Seoul takes a direct route to Pyongyang. The route over the West Sea crosses into North Korean territory in a mere 35 minutes. Seoul and Pyongyang are only one hour apart. The land that seemed like it would never open its doors was always this close.
Pyongyang's Sunan Airport is filled with people here to welcome the South Korean president. And unexpectedly, North Korea's leader, National Defense Commission Chairman Kim Jong-il, appears. Glad to see you. I have wanted to meet you. So begins this historic meeting between the two Koreas. The parade and march of the People's Army. This is North Korea's most cordial reception of a visiting foreign dignitary. The unconventional welcome does not end there. Chairman Kim Jong-il rides with President Kim to the Baekhwa Wan guest house where the president is staying. The first inter-Korean summit in history. The hurdles that had to be cleared to get to this point were numerous. February 1998. President Kim, whose 40-year run as the opposition leader ended with his inauguration, advocated talks with North Korea as soon as he gained office. This was the signal that a new era of cooperation and reconciliation had begun. Kim Dae-jung's policies soon received international praise. His policy of positive engagement towards the North, known as the Sunshine Policy, was credited for easing tensions and for bringing the two Koreas, who had previously been hostile to each other politically and militarily, to the negotiation point. With the leadership of President Kim and, and, the, and the position that he has taken, we strongly support it. President Kim's efforts soon bore fruit in a meeting between South and North Korean officials in 1998. Here, plans for improving inter-Korean relations and South Korean aid to the North were discussed. South Korea decided to give food to aid the severe famine in the North and foster collaboration between North Korean labor and South Korean capital and skills. As a result, the trade exchange between the Koreas in 1999 totaled $330 million, a record high since inter-Korean exchange began in 1989. In 1998, the way was opened for South Koreans to visit Mount Kumgang in the north. As of April 7th of this year, there have been 430 trips to Kumgangsan and a total of more than 210,000 visitors. But the Sunshine Policy did not go entirely unchallenged. In August 1998, North Korea again created tension on the peninsula with its firing of long-range missiles over Japanese waters. And in June of 1999, the two Koreas even exchanged fire in the West Sea. Pressure to abandon the Sunshine Policy grew in the South. But Kim did not abandon his tolerant policy towards the North, nor the hope that the two Koreas could be brought to peaceful negotiations.
March 2000. President Kim once again pressed for an inter-Korean summit for peaceful exchange between the two countries. North Korea reacted positively. Secret envoys were exchanged and a meeting was scheduled. When plans for the summit were made public, the U.S. credited Kim's tenacious adherence to his sunshine policy. The Japanese government also acknowledged the summit as an important event in the history of the two Koreas. China as well welcomed news of the summit. The four powers, the U.S., Japan, China, and Russia, all showed much interest in the Inter-Korean summit. President Kim and President Clinton soon entered talks. And Japan, which wanted to establish diplomatic ties with North Korea and retrieve kidnapped Japanese from the North, requested that Japanese-North Korean relations be on the summit agenda as well. Ten days prior to the summit, Chairman Kim Jong-il met with Chinese leader Jiang Zemin. The summit was expected to be a crucial event, reshuffling global relations among the powers. Korean and foreign reporters at the press center expressed their congratulations with standing ovations as they watched the meeting between the leaders of the two Koreas. No one could hide their surprise at the unexpected appearance by Chairman Kim and the passionate cheers of the people in the streets of Pyongyang. As President Kim and his entourage drove toward downtown Pyongyang, 600,000 people greeted them with flowers. The population of Pyongyang is about two million. Almost one third of its citizens had come out to greet the South Korean president. After driving around the city for over an hour, the president and his entourage arrived at Baekhwawan State Guest House and began the formal itinerary. President Kim is the most important guest ever to visit the north from the south since the division of the peninsula. He is a messenger of hope who will try to transform the confrontational relationship of the past 55 years into a relationship of reconciliation and cooperation. A new page in the history of South and North was being written.
The entire proceedings of the summit are broadcast live through the special equipment set up at the Koryo Hotel, where the South Korean journalists are to stay. The South Korean press coverage is relayed live through North Korea's central broadcasting station to the press center at the Lotte Hotel in Seoul. This is the first ever collaboration between the South Korean and North Korean press. The first item on President Kim's itinerary is a visit to the Mansu Day National Assembly. Kim Yang Nam, the nominal head of North Korea, greets President Kim warmly. The daughter of Lee Hyun Sung, a guerrilla captain during the Korean War, guides the tour of the Mansu Day National Assembly, home to the Communist Committee, the highest decision making institution in North Korea. Built in 1984, this hall's interior is made of natural marble. The historic meeting of the two kings is passed on to the North Korean people through television broadcasts. The usual criticism of the South was nowhere to be found in the North's thorough coverage of President Kim's activities. The Nodong Shinmu, the newspaper of the Workers' Party in the North, spent five of its six pages analyzing the historical meaning of the summit. Applause fills the streets in the South as the image of the two leaders holding hands is broadcast. Those who have spent the past 50 years separated from their loved ones shed tears of hope. Work is suspended as people are glued to their TVs. German point of view is always a bit uh, special because we had the same part of it, we had the same uh, history and we share the feelings of the Koreans. So the audience can always compare, well, we remember it was this way in our history and okay, that's what they feel. So there's a special interest, of course, and I think uh, they understand the feelings of the Korean people very well. Change is evident in the streets of Pyongyang as well. An air of cordiality and welcome is everywhere. A confrontational relationship that existed between North and South for the past 50 years imposed the fear of war on everyone. Relief from that fear is one of the chief purposes of this summit.
The conflict on the peninsula has been intensified by the fact that the two nations are of one people. The forced separation of parents and children has continued for 50 long years. This is the reason that the inter-Korean summit is said to have a humanitarian purpose, that of reuniting divided families. The South Korean entourage's second day in Pyongyang. The one-on-one -on -one meeting between the leaders of the two Koreas is scheduled for this afternoon. The first South Korean president to set foot on North Korean soil. And the first ever inter-Korean summit. What kind of results will it bring? This day, First Lady Lee Hee-ho goes out into the city of Pyongyang to meet North Korea's people and children. This is a totally devoted welcome. The children honor their guest from the South with no restraints. The warm welcome and exceptional performance is a symbolic reaching out to all South Koreans. North Korea takes great pride in the Pyongyang Maternity Center, whose world-class size and facilities make it a mandatory stop for foreign visitors. <laughs> <laughs> Lee Hee Ho congratulates the mother of an infant born during the inter-Korean summit. <laughs> Next, the first lady is reunited with her old high school teacher, whom she hasn't seen in 60 years. The teacher, who was in her 90s, came north with her husband at the onset of the Korean War. And the student, who was in her 70s, still remembers her fondly. Had it not been for the summit, this meeting would have been impossible. There are so many people in the two Koreas who have longed for such a meeting. It was a hopeless longing until now. Today, the president's entourage tours Pyongyang by subway. Pyongyang's subway system, which took 20 years to complete, is a widely used, convenient mode of transportation in a city with few automobiles.
The members of the entourage who represent various organizations and companies wanted to learn more about the way of life in Pyongyang through such tours of the city. This is the computer education center North Korea has set up to advance its information and technology sector. The members of the entourage were especially interested in the computer center because it had been established through cooperation between the South and the North. <laughs> 3 p.m. President Kim Dae-jung and Chairman Kim Jong-il finally begin their private one-on-one -on -one summit. Before the two leaders enter the meeting, they read coverage of the summit in a South Korean newspaper together. It is the first time in history that Kim Jong-il has been so extensively covered in a South Korean paper. Through the years, Kim Jong-il has been a veiled and elusive figure. The meeting begins with a greeting by Kim Jong-il, relaying the feelings of the citizens of Pyongyang. The two leaders' lighthearted jokes create a harmonious atmosphere in the meeting room. The journalists are asked to leave the room as the formal meeting begins. The first meeting between the leaders of two hostile countries. What kinds of things would they say? And what kinds of results would they produce? In the past 55 years, the two Koreas have produced two agreements. The first was the July 4th communique of 1972. It attempted to transform the confrontational relationship between the two Koreas into a relationship of reconciliation and cooperation, moving towards peaceful reunification. 
This communique was the first political agreement between North and South Korea since the armistice. According to the communique, talks aimed at solving the problems of the peninsula were to continue, and reunification seemed to be only a matter of time. But dialogue soon deteriorated, and the communique became an agreement in name only. Twenty years later, the two Koreas produced another agreement based on three principles, reconciliation among the people, mutual non-aggression, and cooperative exchanges. It contained ample provisions for economic and social cooperation, communications, and almost every other possible aspect of interaction between the two sides. Yet this agreement likewise failed to be effective, and relations between the two Koreas stagnated. In 1994, the relationship between the two Koreas seemed to have come to another turning point. At the urging of former U.S. President Jimmy Carter, the two Koreas agreed to hold an inter-Korean summit. However, due to the sudden death of North Korean leader Kim Il-sung, plans for the summit were indefinitely postponed. While the one-on-one -on -one meeting of the two leaders of the Koreas is taking place, over 1,000 journalists wait tensely for the results at the Lotte Hotel Press Center in Seoul. Tensions also prevail among the South Korean journalists covering the summit in Pyongyang, but the historic meeting between the two leaders shows no sign of ending, even after more than three hours. Kim Jong-il 국방위원장께서는 적극적이고 긍정적인 자세로 회담에 임했고 합리적으로 문제에 접근하여 토의하자는 자세를 보여주셨습니다. June 14, 11:20 p.m. President Kim Dae-jung and Chairman Kim Jong-il end their marathon meeting and prepare to sign their agreement. It is a historic agreement between the two Koreas, advocating reconciliation, cooperation, and exchange. Now the two countries could turn the page on their long-standing confrontational relationship and work together towards peace and mutual benefit. A new era was beginning on the peninsula. The curtain is closing on the last act of the Cold War. The tip of the iceberg has begun to melt. This is the judgment of the international media. The leaders of governments that have been bitter enemies for so many years are at last sitting down and talking could represent a fundamental change on the Korean Peninsula. I don't know. On that, I think we, we, we can't know yet, but it's in, they talked about family reunifications. That's a huge first step. That's a good thing. Oh, I, I found it remarkable and uh, exciting and surprising. Uh, I think it's beyond what anybody expected. Um, things we've learned about uh, Kim Jong-il and the way he's come across has been a huge surprise to me, like it has been to everybody else. The historic South-North Joint Declaration in Pyongyang is the culmination of President Kim Dae-jung's untiring efforts for peace and reconciliation. 
When Kim Dae-jung first ran for the presidency in 1971, he advocated three principles of reunification, mutual exchange with the North, diplomacy with the communists, and peaceful cooperation among the four surrounding powers, the US, China, Russia, then the Soviet Union, and Japan. However, these were considered dangerous moves in an era when the South thought of the North as a rogue country. Kim paid the price for his ideas in five near-death encounters, 183 days of house arrest, six years in jail, and two years in exile. He was even sentenced to death. Although he was accused of being a communist sympathizer, he stood his ground, establishing a three-policy, three-step plan towards peace and reunification. This faith in peace has finally been realized in the South-North Joint Declaration. The Inter-Korean Joint Declaration calls for an autonomous solution for reunification, recognition of commonalities in each other's unification proposals, exchange of visits among separated families, economic cooperation at increased exchanges, and the opening of follow-up talks and an invitation to Kim Jong-il to visit Seoul. The first item of the declaration was strongly emphasized at the summit. This is because this policy was also clearly stated in both the July 4th Joint Communique of 1972 and the Basic Agreement of 1992. Rather than saying that it excludes other countries from involvement in the affairs of the Korean Peninsula, the declaration states that the Koreas are to solve their problems themselves without the intervention of foreign powers. That the two Koreas admit similarities between their plans for reunification is important in that they acknowledge the existence of two different ideologies. North Korea's federation plan calls for one nation, two political structures, and two governments. But it is similar to the South's in that it calls for a federal government that is weaker than the local governments. The basic plan of the South is modeled on the policy established by Kim Dae-jung in the 70s. This plan calls for a League of Nations in which the two Koreas would remain as they are, except with the institution of free travel and collaborative exchange. The reunion of separated family members is a humanitarian issue that must be solved. According to government statistics, about 7.6 million people in the South originated in the North. First-generation migrants are now old enough that any delay in establishing reunions would leave this issue unresolved forever. Over the years, the problem of reuniting separated family members has been an issue at every meeting of every kind between the two Koreas. <laughs> but reunions have actually happened only once in 1985 and have failed to become a permanent program. The declaration also addresses various plans for rebuilding trust between the two Koreas. 
Among these, the issue receiving the most attention is economic cooperation, aimed at balanced growth in both countries. With this declaration, the two Koreas are more likely to establish laws to guarantee inter-Korean investments and prevent double taxation, which were previously obstacles to economic cooperation. On the day that the South Korean president Kim Dae-jung and his entourage are to return to Seoul, North Korean officials promise to put the joint declaration into practice with sincerity and good faith. The two leaders have become close enough to converse without reserve, as if they were old friends. <laughs> Until this inter-Korean summit, reconciliation between the two Koreas was considered impossible. It did not seem that the wall of mistrust that had been built over the past half century could be torn down. Thus, the image that President Kim Dae-jung and Chairman Kim Jong-il portrayed to the people during this summit is even more precious and valuable. The peace and reunification that Koreans everywhere long for has become a possibility. Reconciliation and cooperation has done away with the fear of war in a region that has spent the past half century in a dark tunnel. This victory was for all those who did not give up on peace, even through opposition and through the trials their beliefs brought on. Korea's citizens waved goodbye to the South Korean president at his departure as fervently as they greeted him at his arrival. Before leaving, Kim Dae-jung again invites Kim Jong-il to visit Seoul in the hopes that the relationship forged at this summit would continue to grow. The peninsula will no longer be a region of conflict as long as the leaders of the two Koreas continue to meet. The bud of peace has begun to blossom.
존경하고 사랑하는 국민 여러분 역사적인 방북 임무를 대과 없이 마치고 지금 귀국했습니다 모든 것이 다 잘됐고 아무 걱정 없다는 얘기는 절대로 아닙니다 이게 시작일 뿐입니다 이제 가능성을 보고 왔다는 것 뿐입니다 시간이 걸릴 겁니다 일내심이 필요합니다 또 성의가 필요합니다 역지사지에서 상대방 입장에서 생각하는 것도 필요합니다 안보 대한민국 주최성 여기에는 추워도 흔들림이 없대 상대방 입장도 생각하면서 협력해서 그렇게 해서 쉬운 것부터 하나하나 밟아가면서 종국에는 공의 길로 나가는 것이 그것이 옳은 길입니다. Thank you.